Hello friends, welcome to my next video, The Neurology Dilemma. Now since we have already seen the basic tips of taking a case history, here are a few tips for taking a neurology case because a neurology case follows a slightly different approach compared to the routine cases. So to start with, first describe your history of present illness like a story that is necessary to know the exact onset and progress of a disease. For example, if a patient comes with a chief complaint of weakness of upper, left upper and lower limbs since last two days, then your history of present illness should go somewhat like this. Two days before, at 7 am in the morning, patient woke up, brushed his teeth, performed his daily activities and had breakfast. After having breakfast, he left for work. While driving his car from home to work, he experienced a sudden onset weakness in left upper limb and left lower limb in such a way that he was unable to hold the steer wheel. At the same time, he was unable to place his left foot on the accelerator pedal. Following which, the patient immediately decelerated and stopped the vehicle on the side of the road. So you see here, by the main chief complaint itself, we can understand whether it is a proximal weakness or a distal weakness. So here are a few questions that need to be asked to rule out whether it's a proximal or a distal. For example, if proximal upper limb is what you're considering is to be involved, then the common questions that need to be asked is whether there's a difficulty in combing hair or whether there's difficulty in lifting objects from a height. If you want to ask about the distal upper limb, then questions should be like, for example, holding a glass of water or buttoning unbuttoning shirt. And if it is about proximal lower limb, then difficulty in getting up from sitting position or difficulty in climbing stairs. And for distal lower limb, you can ask something like difficulty in gripping the slippers. So all these basic questions can help you categorize each of those weakness as proximal or distal upper and lower limb weakness. Another important complaint that is commonly encountered while taking a neurology case is the complaint of giddiness. The giddiness term is used so blanketly that we are unable to differentiate between common terms such as giddiness, dizziness, vertigo, synco and so on and so forth. So first let, first let us know what is the meaning of each of them. To start with first giddiness. Giddiness means that there is a sense of rotatory motion. Vertigo means a sense of spinning. So you can say that vertigo and giddiness come more or less or can be used interchangeably because vertigo is a part of the giddiness symptom itself. Then comes the next one that is dizziness. Dizziness is a sense of lightheadedness or a kind of an unsteadiness or being off balance as you can say. Then there is another term which is called as a presyncope. Presyncope is unsteadiness with heaviness in lower limbs such that it may precipitate to blurring of vision and followed by blackout. This is called as presyncope. And syncope has got the traditional definition which states that there is transient loss of consciousness due to abrupt decrease in cerebral blood flow. So when you're using all these terms, make sure that you know the meaning of each of them. For example, let's say a patient says, Ki mujhe chakkar aare. So this big chakkar can be categorized as giddiness or vertigo because of the spinning or the rotatory motion. Let's say the patient says, Mujhe chalte samay ek baju girne jaisa ho raha hai, ya aage ya piche girne jaisa ho raha hai. That shows that there is a history of imbalance in walking. Let's say the patient says, Chakkar aake gira aur fir kuch samay ke liye behosh ho gaya. That is what is called a synco. So this is how you categorize the complaint of giddiness. Another important complaint which we commonly encounter is difficulty in speaking. Difficulty in speaking can occur in various forms. So it is very essential to ask certain questions or what you can say is leading questions to categorize as to what kind of dysphasia, aphasia or dysarthria it is. Let's say for example a patient says or patient is noticed to have difficulty in speaking since last two days. So the common questions which need to be asked is first of all whether patient is finding it difficult to comprehend what his relatives are speaking around him. Number two whether patient is having slurred speech, whether patient is having third number uh, third whether patient is having slow pronunciation of speech, fourth whether patient is having a nasal twang. Fifth, whether patient is speaking any kind of meaningless words in between the speech. 
So in this way, if you categorize or represent your history, you would be able to categorize into which category of dysphasia or dysarthria it falls into. Another important complaint which is commonly encountered is the complaint of convulsion. And it's very important that you narrate the history of convulsion like a story. So you may say as to where, when and what was the patient doing when the convulsion occurred. Then it began with involuntary movement of which part of the body, progressed to which part and the duration it involved. Then you can ask about associated features such as whether it was associated with uprolling of eyeball, whether it was associated with frothing from mouth or whether it was associated with tongue bite or if it was associated with loss of consciousness. And if it was associated with drowsiness or loss of consciousness, the duration is also must to be mentioned. Moreover, apart from loss of consciousness, how much time did the patient take to recover and the patient to get up? That is also an important part of the history. Another history that can be asked is history of infrequent blinking, just to make sure whether it is a kind of an absence seizure or something like that. Or you can ask or also ask about history of urinary and fecal incontinence and history of post ictal paralysis, whether there is any weakness on any part of the body, what we call as Dodd's palsy. So most important complaints or what I've mentioned up till now are the ones which are commonly seen in a neurological case. Rest of the complaints, you can use the same criteria like the way I mentioned in my previous video, the various parameters in which each complaint needs to be mentioned. Mentioned In the same way, the remaining complaints can also be taken into account. While taking the history of all these complaints, it's important that you do not lose the flow of the story. Let's say you describe the whole of part of the convulsion. But it is also necessary that you keep a track of the time record. Let's say for example, just as, like as I said earlier, while patient was driving he, driving, he had a weakness of left upper and lower limb. So you can continue like this, that patient stopped by himself at the side of the road. Then he gave a call to his brother. Within 15 to 20 minutes, his brother came. He was taken to the hospital. While going to the hospital, he noticed deviation of angle of mount to the right side and so on and so forth. So keep track of the sequence and the time of events that are occurring. Now comes the most important part of a neurological case, that is the negative history. I have seen that many of us find it very difficult to mention the negative history of a neurological case. An easier way to do, do it is go for the examination subheadings and ask questions which correspond to each of those subheadings. For example, let's say now you have taken the history of a neurological case and then you proceed with the negative history. To start with, the first thing that comes in examination is cortex. So with relation to cortex, you will ask questions such as no history of headache, no history of loss of consciousness, no history of difficulty in speech and no history of convulsion. So these are the major complaints which can be asked with respect to cortex. Following which, let's go to the motor system. In the motor system, the first parameter that is judged is nutrition. So in case of nutrition, you can ask negative history such as no history of loosening of clothes. Next comes tone. For tone, you can ask no history of stiffening of limbs or no history of difficulty in folding limbs while climbing the stairs. Following this tone, each of the complaints which you have asked in tone corresponds to rigidity and spasticity. Then comes the power. As I mentioned earlier, where we are asking questions for proximal upper, lower limb, distal upper and lower limb, that are the major questions which need to be asked for power. Moving ahead for sensory system, you will ask questions such as no history of cotton wool sensation while walking, which can give you an idea whether a neuropathy kind of feature is present or not. Number two, no history of falling forward while washing face, which is characteristically called as the wash basin sign seen in cases of sensory attacks here. Third, no history of band like sensation, which may be seen in cases of compressive myelopathy or any kind of a spinal cord lesion. Fourth, no history of electric shock like sensation on neck movement, which in which tends to suggest that there could be a cervical cord involvement. Then no history of loss of hot or cold water sensation while having bath. This can help you localize it whether lateral spi whether spinothalamic tract is involved or not. So this concludes your sensory history. Then moving on to cranial nerves. For cranial nerves, it is necessary to ask history starting from the first cranial nerve up to the 12th. Like for example, no history of loss of smell, no history of diminution of vision, blurred vision, no history of diplopia, 
no history of difficulty in moving movement of eyeballs then no history of loss of sensation or hot or cold water sensation while washing face then no history of deviation of angle of mouth to any one particular side or no history of difficulty in blowing the mouth no history of opening tightly closed eyes no history of hearing loss or tinnitus no history of loss of taste sensation no history of dysphagia no history of moving neck from side to side or, or from up to down then uh, no history of difficulty in protrusion of tongue so in this way you can ask history for cranial nerves from 1 to 12 but the most important thing to remember and a very impressive kind of feature in a good student is asking the cranial nerve history with respect to relevance to your case for example let's say you are taking the history of a brainstem kind involvement kind of a neurological case so depending upon where you are able to localize the lesion let's say for example you are you're localizing it to midbrain so asking the cranial nerve history of third and fourth cranial nerve is important let's say you are localizing it to pons then fifth sixth seventh and eighth nerve history is important if it is medulla then 9 10 11 12th let's say you are taking the case of gbs so the most important cranial nerves that need to be asked is cranial nerves from 3 to 7 and 9 to 12 because these are the nerves which are commonly involved in a case of gbs apart from cranial nerve history the next and most important thing to know is bladder history so when you are asking about urinary bladder history never ever mention no history of urinary incontinence or no history of bladder involvement a good sign would be to ask specific questions like for example no history of sensation of full bladder no history of difficulty in initiation of maturation at will and controlling the flow no history of precipitation of urine before reaching the bathroom no history of passing urine in inappropriate places with or without social embarrassment so factors such as urgency, hesitancy, frequency, precipitancy, all these factors can be assessed to categorize into which category of neurogenic bladder it belongs to in case the bladder is involved. Next question you may ask is with respect to involuntary movement, like no history of twitching or flickering movement seen on any part of the body. The next question which you need to ask is with localization of cerebellar findings. So for cerebellum, the negative history you'll ask is no history of swaying to the sides or no history of swaying forward or backward while walking. This completes your entire negative history of only central nervous system. Following which you will ask with respect to different systems. Like for example, if you're suspecting a cardioembolic stroke, then history of serious complaints, complaints like I mentioned in my previous video is also important. Let's say for example, you have a case where you're suspecting uremic or hepatic encephalopathy. So gastrointestinal complaints negative history is also important. Following which, if you're suspecting something like CO2 retention, then you need to ask about respiratory complaints also. After all of this, you are going to ask about history of constitutional complaints like weight loss or loss of appetite, followed by another important complaint that is no history of trauma and no history of falls. All of these comprise together of the negative history of a CNS case. But make sure that when you write the negative history, it should be relevant to your case. These are the common things or the common history taking questions that need to be asked, but mention only those which are relevant to your case. Coming to, the, to an important part of writing your provisional diagnosis following the complete history taking process. So your provisional diagnosis goes like this. To start with, you will say whether it is acute or gradual in onset followed by bilateral, unilateral, left-sided or right-sided, followed by symmetrical or asymmetrical, followed by sensory or motor or sensory motor, followed by hemiparesis, hemiplegia, paraplegia or paraparesis, and whether it is complete or crossed, that also needs to be mentioned, with or without cranial nerve involvement, with or without bowel bladder involvement, with or without cerebellar involvement, following which you will write, most likely secondary to thrombotic or embolic or hemorrhagic infarct in which territory whether it is middle cerebral artery or anterior cerebral artery or posterior cerebral artery involving which part of the cortex like frontal, parietal, temporal or occipital. This is one way of mentioning the provisional diagnosis but an easier and a more convenient way would be to categorize it into four aspects. Number one, functional diagnosis. Number two, physiological diagnosis. 
Number three, anatomical diagnosis. And finally, etiological diagnosis. So your functional diagnosis goes like this. Whether there is hemiparesis or paraparesis, without, with or without cranial nerve involvement, with or without bowel bladder involvement, with or without cerebellar involvement. This completes your functional diagnosis. Coming to physiological diagnosis, it is necessary to mention which tract is involved and what kind of neurogenic bladder it is. That comes to be physiological. Third comes anatomical diagnosis, where if you are suspecting a spinal cord lesion, then you will mention the level of lesion, whether it is a compressive or a non-compressive myelopathy. And in case it is a cortex involvement kind of a diagnosis, then you will say whether it is a motor cortex or a sensory cortex involvement. Finally, coming to the etiological diagnosis, whether it is a thrombotic, embolic or hemorrhagic infarct and involving which territory that is ACA, MCA or PCA territory needs to be mentioned. This completes your entire provisional diagnosis. So hopefully this case history taking has helped you come to a close conclusion of how a neurological case must be taken. If you like the video, please click the like button and subscribe button. Thank you.